Yeah, hello everyone. I think we can start now. So today's webinar is about why India needs to decouple from China and understanding China's global enterprise. So I'm Abhishek Ranjan from Red Lalton Analytica. It's an international relations observer group. And uh, our moderator for today's session is Mr. Jairaj Pandya. Uh, he is a present assistant professor at Rashtri Raksha University. Uh, been a CA and lawyer also, a LAMP fellow. So over to you, Jairaj. Thank you so much, Abhishek. Uh, thank you, uh, Red Lantern Anal Analytica, for giving me an opportunity. Uh, I would like to welcome all the, uh, the speakers as well as the participants who have joined us from different parts of the country as well as across the world. Uh, as you know, the subject is something that is, in, in general sense, we call it the elephant in the room, but because the subject matter is China, let us call it the dragon in the room. So we just come straight to the subject and uh, we have a stellar cast, uh, a stellar set of speakers who are going to uh, speak and who are going to deliver their remarks on this subject. Uh, we have uh, a member of parliament, uh, we have uh, a specialist expert on defense subjects, we have a uh, couple of academicians as well as we have someone who specializes on uh, on the subject of the kind of oppressive activities that china does on various on various communities in within their within the region so uh, without without wasting a lot of time i would like to invite the first speaker uh, who is dr amar patnaik uh, dr amar patnaik sir is the member of parliament from the state of odisha he uh, he's he's uh, from the upper house, which is the Rajya Sabha. And uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Patnaik, who's also served in the past as an Indian Accounts and Audit Service Officer, which basically means experience accounts and auditing. And uh, uh, he's pursued his education from some of the finest institutes uh, in the country and abroad. And uh, we would like to take his his remarks on this subject as to what does a public representative of the country uh, speaks about this very, very specific and important issue. So I would like to request uh, uh, Dr. Patnaik, sir. I think he has not joined yet. So can we move to the next speaker, Jairaj? Okay. Oh, sir, okay. Sir, 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 can we just ask him? But next, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Can you can you get my video on, please? No, your video is off, sir. But anyway, it's not coming here. Oh. Let it be. There is a option. Yeah, no, no, the option was not working. Double yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Right. We can we can view you now. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. The audio was on, but the video was on. Sir, uh, sir, I would like to. Uh, so we just uh, we're giving a brief introduction of uh, sir, uh, the first speaker, sir, uh, which is uh, this case that you are going to speak the the first in the session. Uh, sir, we'd like to request you to make your remarks, sir, on the subject. Thank you so much, uh, uh, everybody, everyone here, uh, particularly to the organizers, uh, Ray Lantern Analytica. Uh, very interesting topic indeed, actually. Uh, so I thought I thought uh, I would just uh, uh, try to uh, broaden a little bit the scope of the topic to say that what are the engagements to begin with by saying that what is the kind of engagements two nations can have and particularly that so with China which we all know it's at the diplomatic and political or economic or military. Now with China, surprisingly, we have, do not have much military uh, uh, relationship. So there is no question of really decoupling there. Uh, whereas uh, at the political level, as we know, we have the uh, people, we, 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 we do talk, but uh, the, the kind of uh, engagement uh, between a democracy and uh, uh, and as the Chinese love to call themselves a centralized democracy, as they say, but the whole world looks at them differently. We do not have, again, much engagement. Uh, at the diplomatic level, 
Uh, I would definitely say that uh, we have to be coupled with them in, in the sense that we cannot completely disengage. Uh, so it boils down to what everybody has been discussing, uh, including the government of India, that we need to have uh, economic decoupling. And this was accentuated particularly during the period of the COVID-19 when people realized that the supply chains of the entire world, most of the supply chains rather, are based in China. Uh, so, so the point here is that when you are talking about decoupling, I would really uh, look at it from the point of view of these uh, supply chains. Uh, so to the question, do we need to decouple? Yes, the entire world has recognized. Most of the countries have recognized and India has indeed recognized, thankfully. The second question is how to decouple. And since it is at the economic uh, uh, economic relationship that I discussed about that we have to decouple, it is basically to reduce the uh, trade imbalances, and it would be to reduce the uh, reduce the uh, uh, unfair or rather, uh, you know, we haven't really looked at the, the kind of trade uh, uh, surplus that the China enjoys against India, which currently is I think about forty eight to until last year, 48 to 50 uh, billion US dollars. Now the point here, point here is, uh, when do we decouple? What is the kind of decoupling that we need to have? What will be the contours of this decoupling? Whether it will be in the manufacturing sector or it will be in the services sector, whatever little we have, the relationship. So whether it be at the government, government level, whether it will be at the business to business level. So these are the questions. Uh, that would have to be answered. Uh, so it's not an easy answer, as you uh, as you would realize. China has economic heft, despite all the trauma that the entire world has gone through. Uh, the China still would probably manage to have a positive growth rate in 2020-21 uh, compared to uh, India. Uh, India is, let's say, the most positive thing, being 7.5 minus. Uh, so similarly, if, if we look at the um, the, the uh, supply chains, the APIs, the electric motor. Now, many of the aspirations, many of the aspirations of India in Atmanirbhar Bharat or of the country as a whole in non-conventional non energy sources are actually uh, have to be sourced from China. So the so the uh, so the problem is uh, the decoupling cannot be a kind of turn on and turn off kind of a situation. It has to be, and which I think all of us uh, in this webinar who are who are uh, serious uh, uh, researchers in the in the China studies would realize that it has to spread over a period of time in the short term, in the medium term, and in the long term. The long term goal being what it is that is to have some of those supply chains in India, and therefore the Atmanirbhar Bharat packages that have been announced. But the entire Atmanirbhar package, I've written about this in newspapers, it is premised on the fact that the supply chains that we develop in India do not remain restricted only to India. Okay, it will probably answer uh, some of the questions relating to the sourcing from China, but this trade gap which is there, which is going to be there if you decouple, has to be made good from in other countries. Now, when you do it in other countries, you, we have to be cost competitive. You, you in the name of self-reliance, during the time when we used to have this as the motto, we we could not, we cannot probably uh, go back to a situation where the cost is we are cost uh, incompetitive. And therefore, I had suggested in one of the articles that we could think about uh, bilateral FTAs with our neighbors, and we. Together, let's say India, if it is having a competitive advantage in some product, but if Sri Lanka is having in some other, then we should have agreements so that together we become the uh, supply centers of the world. And this is how the decoupling probably in the medium term and in the long term would work out uh, as I see it. Uh, the, 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 the important thing that is that the, that the decoupling would entail is that these supply chains, which have to be established from end to end, would require to have the cost, as I said, but we cannot have a situation 
like in China, where the wages are controlled and at very low level, where the 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 uh, oh, there is over over overproduction uh, in some things which 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 they can dump in um, countries like Africa. So we have to have uh, take that into account, and therefore I think, to my mind, decoupling is necessary and is uh, is, is is probably what uh, uh, every Indian would love to. Uh, see and I would love to see too, but uh, it is a difficult proposition. We need to grow at something at 8.8%, I would say, in the next few years. We need to have the economic heft to uh, build our GDP uh, based on investments. Uh, fortunately, the Chinese investments have come down by about $100 million every year since 2018, but we need to get those investments from other parts of the world, and that can only happen if we have bilateral agreements with some of them, and we are able to satisfy their needs, which they are currently getting from China. So, so, so the environment, the entire ecosystem in our country has to be developed in such a manner. I'm saying that we are well on its well on that way. Many people are coming over to set us up, like recently in UP uh, or other states, like in Odessa, for example. We have drawn the maximum amount of foreign direct investment during the COVID period, um, in, the, in particularly the manufacturing, the steel and mine sector. Uh, so we, we 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 have a tall order. The uh, decoupling would require building our uh, not only our competence at the domestic level, but also being cost competitive compared to other parts of the world. Uh, the last part is uh, what what I call as 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 you know. The, the 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 quest for excellence. Uh, I I I I I I am very careful while saying this today that the quest for excellence in manufacturing, the quest for excellence even in services, somehow somewhere it is there, but the quest for excellence in manufacturing has to be built. It cannot be that we would be in a position of mediocrity and still uh, expect to be the leaders in the world completely decoupled from China and supply to the rest of the world what China has been supplied. So with these opening remarks, I would like to uh, end my um, deliberations and would love to hear what the others have to say. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for your insightful remarks. It's indeed uh, worthwhile to know, uh, especially the fact that you mentioned that how the most of the raw material or a lot of uh, the products that are used in our non-renewable sources of energy, <clears throat> they come from uh, China. And also the, the thing that you even mentioned about... Even pharmaceutical API. Absolutely, sir. APIs as well. And even as far as the smartphones are concerned, a lot Absolutely. of these raw materials, they come they come from China. So that's in, indeed a point, sir. And uh, uh, the fact that you mentioned that it's important for us to to have a coherent strategy as far as our economic growth is concerned and not to, not to, not to uh, get ourselves... Uh, too much into the fact that we produce in the country uh, rather than focusing on the quest for excellence because that is something critical both in manufacturing as well as in services. So uh, that's indeed uh, a worthwhile point, sir. Uh, sir, uh, moving further to the next speaker, we have uh, Mr. Abhijit Ayer Mitra. Uh, Abhijit Ayer Mitra is someone who is uh, serving as a senior fellow at the Institute of Peace and Conflict Studies, someone who is very popular as uh, on our television as well is in social media and is someone is pursuing his PhD from King's College London and is also an author of two books. Uh, a defense specialist, uh, Mr. Abhijit Ayer Mitra is uh, going to be our next speaker and I welcome uh, Mr. Abhijit to, to give his remarks. Over to you, Abhijit. Uh, thank you, Jairaj, and thank you, Amarji, for your comments. Um, I'm just going to be my usual pessimistic self, unfortunately. I have uh, uh, only doom and gloom to predict in this sense. <coughs> so, uh, uh, technically, if you look at it, this whole decoupling starts off, this uh, conversation about decoupling, uh, it starts off in the West, because technically, if you look at it, uh, China only accounts for about 0.09% uh, of inwards investment into the United States, and it accounts for only about 3% of uh, inwards investment into the EU. Uh, if you look at the transatlantic trade, that is to say uh, uh, the uh, US-EU trade, 
that is approximately about $1.3 trillion a year. Uh, China's trade with both America and the EU uh, uh, combined would equal that amount. So basically what happens here is that in terms of trade flows, China is important to America, but in terms of investment, it is not that important to America. And this is where, you know, the beginning of a Western decoupling from China starts. But where does the industrial and the manufacturing and the supply chain decoupling begin? Uh, well, remember, the West is the technology supplier to China. Either it's legal technology supply, like setting up, uh, you know, uh, Apple production factories and so on and so forth. Or uh, it is stolen technology, uh, which China is extremely good at. Uh, the problem, of course, with Chinese technology is technology has two components, the how and the why. Now, China is very good at the uh, how. Uh, the problem is they're not very good with the why. And unless you understand the first principles of that, uh, these things seldom uh, actually work, which is why you see China is at a much lower stage. Technically, if you were at the West, let, let's call it Occidentalia or Westosphere or whatever. You're looking at a combined economy of about $44 trillion, $46 trillion and a per capita income of around uh, 44,000 US dollars per capita in the West, uh, 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 Westosphere. And by Westosphere, I of course include South Korea, Japan, Australia, and all these countries, uh, Singapore, that, that are sort of part of this kind of a unified common uh, uh, market defense ecosystem and all of that. Uh, this doesn't happen with China. China is worth about 12, 13 billion dollars or so. Uh, much lower per capita income and therefore much lower human value addition. And they are a middle income economy. They are going to be stuck being a middle income economy, which means they can't move up the production chain. So one of the things, the main decoupling you're going to see with the West is realistically going to be 3D printing and additive manufacturing. I think this week there was news of a, uh, a motorized military boat, a very fast uh, 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 motor boat uh, constructed entirely by 3D printing. Imagine a military standard boat whose hull is uh, constructed through 3D printing. Now, all of this is very good for the West, that the West can decouple. But how does this affect us? Remember, the nature of the Indian economy is very, very strange. We never actually had the manufacturing or industrial revolution. We move directly from being a pre-industrial uh, agrarian society into the services age without going through the manufacturing. So manufacturing capacity in India is extremely poor. There is also an anti-business environment when it comes to manufacturing or physical presence and things like that, which services manage to avoid quite smartly. Uh, you have labor laws and industrial laws that are against it and so on and so forth. Now, the problem is India's production is mostly extremely low level, uh, much lower than China, uh, much less competitive than China. So when 3D manufacturing actually starts the US, uh, sorry, the West uh, China decoupling, the person going to be affected the most is going to be India because it's going to be the smaller things, the easier to produce, the low value chain uh, commodities that get replaced the first, uh, that get replaced first. And then slowly, as you know, the complexity of additive manufacturing goes up, where you're able to process multiple compounds and things like that, that is when China actually starts getting hurt. Now, when we talk of India decoupling from China, we have to bear this in mind that when it goes step in step with a Western decoupling, it's going to get very, very, very bad for us till it starts getting better after a certain point of time, if it starts getting better at all. Now, uh, what are the uh, basic problems that you're looking at? Because uh, the thing is, like I said, we have to move into the manufacturing age. Can you hear me? Okay. 
uh, that's better. Uh, so uh, what happens here is that uh, you have several, even uh, moving past 3D printing, we'll have to move towards a sort of middle manufacturing stage very, very quickly, in which case we can become a sort of substitute for China. Now, what we saw during COVID was that several companies moved out of China, but they didn't move into India. The overwhelming majority of them moved into Vietnam. And this is where you have the fundamental problems that prevented India from industrializing through the 50s and 60s are also going to be the things that prevent us from really moving up the value chain into middle level production. First, we've got an educational deficit. So, you know, in India, we spent about $75 per student per capita. To even get to a factory floor manufacturing level, you need to be spending about $1,000 US per student per capita. The amount required even to get to a factory floor production stage is approximately $650 billion a year. Today, we spend about $23 billion, $8 billion in the private sector, the rest uh, in, in the public sector. And that $8 billion is concentrated to a very, very small, uh, 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 a, a very small uh, upper crust sort of thing that can afford a, a really good education. The second problem, of course, is that in India, you don't have a state monopoly on violence. Uh, riots are quite frequent. Uh, uh, law and order issues are extremely frequent. Just this week, we've seen what happened at the uh, Vistron factory, uh, the Apple uh, manufacturer in uh, uh, Bangalore. Uh, the second issue is you have an extremely highly volatile law and order ecosystem, jurisprudence ecosystem. You have an enforcement deficit in uh, past laws. You also have atrocious regulation, and you've seen this in terms of the uh, Cairn arbitration, which just came. Now, with the Cairn arbitration, it was clear as night and day that some that the Indian government was in the wrong. We still pursued it right up to arbitration, and now it seems that the arbitration is going to be rejected, and it will be challenged in the Supreme Court. And we all know the way the Supreme Court comes down, which it, the government will simply say supreme national interest, and you know, that has always been the winning argument sort of thing. So all of this makes it very, very difficult for us to move into any kind of manufacturing. Now, why is this important? Because remember, for the West and China, the West is the main supplier of technology. It is also the main supplier of markets. Uh, when the technology goes, then the market access becomes precarious. In India, the problem is we are neither the supplier of technology to China, nor are we its biggest market, though we are a very big market. The second problem is the nature of India-China trade is extremely colonial. We export uh, raw materials to China, but we import a whole host of finished products. And remember, the Indian market is extremely price sensitive. Now, when we moved from you know, uh, an agrarian economy to a services economy, most of our services are extremely price sensitive and they are based entirely on Chinese price sensitive technology, which is to say cheap technology. I'm just being very um, uh, diplomatic in that sense, but uh, well, cheap crap, uh, cheap Chinese crap. So what happens is you get rid of the cheap Chinese crap from your market, your services start taking a huge hit. Uh, things, for example, ordinary services like Zomato and things like that. And many things we've been pioneers like coming out home delivery, Zomato, Wonderful. Uh, other apps, great. The problem is all those markets then start shrinking. It becomes a huge problem. Because remember, nobody can afford to buy Apple phones or high-end Samsung phones and things like that. Most of the market makes do with Lava and Huawei and Zolo and uh, all those uh, you know uh, uh, weird uh, uh, brands. So decoupling for India is an extreme extremely precarious uh, task. I would say to the point that it is uh, uh, almost impossible for us to do. And in fact, a Western decoupling from China will hurt us very, very, very hard. I mean, I don't even want to get into the social dimensions of it. Uh, they're horrendous, too horrendous to even contemplate. But uh, I would say that the prospects are given if Cetris Paribus, if what is today continues, uh, the regulatory environment, the investment environment, the nature of our economy, it is virtually impossible to do. Uh, your basic 
uh, dilemma in that sense is how do you change the nature of the trade without having the necessary discipline or the willingness to absorb the pain of changing that nature of your economy? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Abhijit, for your comments. That you've been your pessimistic self, but uh, I'll I'll get your inputs later during our discussion on what do you think can be the, the ways in which some of the points that you mentioned, especially with regards to the technological component and uh, the kind of issues that we face in in within our demo domestic system. uh can be tackled or or i mean we can find some kind of a tangible way out around those issues so we'll definitely have a discussion on that uh, during the later half uh moving on to our third speaker mr kylie albert mr kylie albert is an it professional turned political and human rights activist uh, who channelizes his energies on researching for issues related to china's oppression in uh, east turkestan tibet taiwan hong kong southern mongolia and manchuria he is someone who has a particular area of interest uh in uh, researching and studying the repression of turkish ethnic groups uh the militarization of the occupied occupied territories in the western china and in and around the south china sea so i welcome mr kylie albert and uh, i request him to to make his presentation and uh, and uh, tell us what are his views on the subject to the audience Mr Albert can you hear us Hey can you hear me Yes we can hear you okay. uh, just the, the the volume is a bit uh, is a bit uh, slow if you can just raise the volume Okay um if you could um could you come right back to me I'm going to need to um leave and rejoin the meeting All right okay okay you can we'll do yeah Okay Okay thank you So uh as Mr Albert joins us in a few minutes we move on to the next speaker uh, the next speaker is Shalini Sharma Uh, Dr. Sharma is presently working as a professor of economist in the Christ uh, College, which is soon to be, uh, which is a deemed to be university in Delhi NCR, and uh, she is also an expert with EGRO, and uh, she has an extensive experience of two and a half decades of teaching, researching, training, and administrative experience uh, in the field of academia and research. Uh, so I welcome uh, Dr. Shalini to to make his to make her remarks and give the presentation for the audience. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Jairaj. Uh, I'm just trying to put on my PPTs. Uh, you'll just have to give me a minute so that I yes, can get my uh, presentation, please. Sure, ma'am. So, are you able to see my PPTs? Yes, ma'am. Okay, fine. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Jairaj. and i'm highly grateful to mr abhishek ranjan and to red lantern analytica for organizing a webinar on such a pertinent topic which is not only extremely important for india and the world but also for all of us as citizens of india i will be on the contrary very positive towards this as against our previous speaker so uh, before i start with my presentation uh, let us ponder on to uh, what exactly is happening around the world right now let us ponder if you can uh, ma'am if i can request you to put your uh, presentation on a slide show format so that yes. the, the size of the content that you've uh, put uh, can you see yes it's yes, fine now it's perfect perfect thank you thank you so much so uh, 
The COVID-19 health pandemic has impacted all the realms of human life. The pandemic has led us to economic crisis throughout the world and made us realize the importance of the Gandhian model of self-reliance. We have seen now self-reliance or self-reliant India here is the growth process of an economy should not become dominated or dependent on another economy. We have seen that we have many times imported the inflation from other countries. Now that is something we have to go away from. A self-reliant India, a time when the world is suffering from a deadly pandemic, India plans to convert this crisis into an opportunity and strengthen its fight by becoming Atmanirbhar or self-reliant. Now, before I move on further, let us discuss the imports of India vis-a-vis, -vis, I would be basically going towards China, but I have the data for all over the world. So if you see here, we in 1989, because of the paucity of time and data, we have converted the PPTs into 10, 10 years data structure. So in 1989, we were having maximum of our trade, the imports were coming from United States. Then it was United Kingdom and Japan. In 1999, the structure changed a little. And please see, and please note, China is not here in 1999 as part of our major components coming. So we were, uh, imports were coming from Belgium, United States, Saudi Arabia, Nigeria, United Kingdoms. Now, India's imports in 2009, look, we have a jump towards China is with 11.49% coming from China, which was the main component of our imports. Though United States is also there, but it has fallen down to 6.01%. In 2019, China imports became almost 13.7%, which almost touched 15% in the end of 2019. And now let's look at the exports of India. So we've seen the import side, the export side in 1989, our basic exports were with Soviet Union. And in 1999, we started having exports towards the United States, which was the dominant. And then second number was China with 6.78%. Whereas in 1999, imports from China were almost negligent. But exports to China were 6.78%. In 2009, if you look, the exports to China is falling down from the previous 10 years data. It has come down to 565 and in 2019, it further fell down to 5.08%. So now what is important for us to look at is the trade deficit, which was being converted. Now, if you look at the data here, the yellow uh, portion is telling you the imports and the blue is telling you the exports and the difference between them, the trade deficit, which is negative, of course, is that of the uh, India, which is there. Now, somewhere around 2018, the trade deficit increased to 63, uh, 63 billion dollars. But then slowly and gradually, if you look 2019-20, this trade deficit started falling down. Now, that was what we were looking at it from India's point of view. Now, this is from China's point of view. And from China's point of view, if we look here, the uh, mehroon shade is the exports and the pink is the import. So if you look that in financial year 15, the export was 2.6 and the import was only 0.8 of China from India. And this increased to only 0.9% in financial year 19, whereas the exports had increased from 2.6 to 3% for China towards India. Now, another important thing that comes into mind is the composition of imports from China. 
Now, of course, if you look at these figures, the electrical machinery, it in 2017-18, which is green in shade, and the uh, red is the 2018-19, if you see, there is a decrease. But rest of the data, rest of the uh, imports are showing a positive increase. For example, the nuclear machinery, the organic chemicals, they almost increased to 31.5%. Now, what is worrying me is the fertilizers. So if you look at here, there's 108.51% increase in the growth of fertilizer imports from China to India. So that is the composition. So the current uh, scenario, very important and pertinent thoughts that would come into our mind. It, that is approximately 15% of India's imports and 5% of India's exports are towards China. Will India really be able to break the dependence on China? And would we be successful? This is a very important, pertinent question, which would be actually coming in the minds of all of us here. The good news is, if we look at the latest data, the exports to China have actually increased to 6.7% during this pandemic period, and the imports have also decreased from China. So uh, I would say, let us look at the Indian perspective. The make in India, the initi initiation or the initiative was started in 2014 by the government of India to encourage companies to manufacture in India and incentivize dedicated investment to manufacturing. We also encouraged the zero effect and zero defect production and maintaining a high quality so that our produce is being readily accepted outside by the world. Government has facilitated investment innovation, skill development, protected intellectual property, and built best-in-class manufacturing infrastructure in the country. Sell in the world, but manufacture in India was, in fact, is the basic idea. The second is the Atmanirbhar Bharat. The Abhyan package focuses on land, labor, liquidity and laws which will cater to various sections including cottage industry msmes laborers middle class and industry the five pillars that atmanirbhar is actually catering to is the economy the infrastructure system demography and demand so these are very important points and this atmanirbhar is a strengthening of the make in india Abhyan, which was started in 2040. A boost has been provided with various impetus for the growth of startups in India. In fact, we are seeing a mushrooming up of startups which are being initiated by our youth. The ban on 200, approximately 200 Chinese applications, it is just not a signal, but a lot of substance behind this move of India. We are also limiting the Chinese presence in 5G in India. Many policies have also been devised and implemented towards it. But this is a short-run strategy. If you remember what we just discussed about the imports from China and its dependence and our dependence on those imports, we need a very long-run strategy. We need to go away from the structural import dependency on China. It will take approximately two to eight years for India to make domestic base for the same. In fact, we are trying to reduce these dependencies and that is predominantly why Make in India was launched. Indian government is now trying to come out with policies to attract value, global value chains, and supply chains in India. A move has started, and we are seeing that a lot of FDIs are flowing down to India. 18th largest FDI in India is from China. 
But the good thing is that 90% of the direct investment from China is in manufacturing. And this should continue as India is having favorable policies for the same. Now, let us look at the world perspective. Now, that was the Indian perspective. Now, there's a world perspective, which is also uh, helping India to grow further. At present, economic blowback is being faced by China from throughout the world. The world has realized the risks associated for being heavily reliant on one country, that is China, for global supply chain. Because of the population structure in China, there is a rising wage cost and multinationals have been thinking since a number of years how they can diversify and move away from China dominance and find a production base outside China, which will have low costs, good supply chains and markets. And please remember here that India has the second largest population in the world. And look at the amount of demand we can create in our own country. China, as of now, is facing trouble with its relations with most of its top trading partners like South Korea, Japan, US, Australia, India, etc. It is also facing problems because of its wolf warrior diplomacy. Now, this brings me back to our last slide. India will emerge as a production destination hub and we will be able to go away from China, maybe not, but yes, over a period of time, because all our policies and our initiatives are going in the right direction. Of course, we require a lot of technology and we do require a lot of investment in technology. And that also is going ahead. Emotional and the India is in its favor, in fact, highly in favor of India. We have already started off with a skill-oriented education system, and we are following it rigorously, especially with the new education policy. The English popula speaking population of India is dominant in India, which helps the uh, value chains to be created now back into India rather than China. And the democratic country which we are will help us to have the MNCs coming back into India from China and we moving away from China towards India. We therefore propose that our economy will rise steeply as soon as we overcome with this pandemic. Thank you. During the discussion, I would like to take your points or uh, your inputs on uh, uh, what do you think about the the debt trap diplomacy? Because you mentioned about the the wolf warrior diplomacy, about the kind of techniques that uh, China has used for for expansion expansion of its colonial enterprise, uh, as well as the emergence of court. Right now, that we are seeing a kind of a grouping that is coming uh, between Australia, India, Japan. Uh, uh, in, I mean, something uh, and the USA across the world, across and right now we are seeing it only in the defense domain predominantly. But uh, in the coming months, we can also expect its its uh, you know its ramifications to be to be seen on the economic and the technological front as well. So thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, moving on uh, to the speaker, uh, uh, Mr. Kylie Albert. Uh, Mr. Albert, uh, will you be in a position to make your presentation now? Yeah, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, wonderful. Um, I really appreciate you all having me. Um, and uh, I believe it's the, uh, the only American who's presenting. I kind of wanted to make the case, um, not, not merely the human rights case, but uh, the case as to why I think it's a strategic imperative 
that India decouples from China. I've heard um, a lot of good reasons why it's going to be difficult, but I want to make the case as to why there's no other option, right? Um, so kind of for background, um, so you understand where I'm approaching this from. Um, back in 1890, Rear Admiral Mahan um, kind of postulated his theory as to um, uh, essentially who controls the seas and who controls the choke points controls the world, right? There's, there's um, the theory that um, naval power was a defining characteristic of national greatness. Then Mackinder came along. Mackinder said that, you know, who controls kind of the heartland of the world um, would control uh, would control the globe, right? And then Spikeman came along um, in the geography of peace, and he said, who controls the Rimland controls Eurasia, and who rules Eurasia controls the destinies of the world. So that's kind of the way that we've been operating, you know, for the past 100 years. We fought um, two world wars um, over McKinder's and Spikeman's um, kind of conception of the world, right? Uh, Mayhem's choke points today are really more relevant, especially in terms of, you know, how India should be looking at the world. The two biggest naval choke points in the world um, are there or right by India, the Strait of Hormuz and uh, the Straits of Malacca, right? When you look at the um, flow of petroleum that transits the ocean, right? Actually, most of it goes right by India. When we look here at, at China's, um, China's strategy, the string of pearls strategy to kind of surround India um, with the, this network of, of ports and bases and, um, you know, a listening post and what have you, um, we can see that, that China's trying to box India in. Right? And we can see the two choke points there. And then we can see the port of Gwadar. That kind of shows the oil supply route a little bit better. Now, looking at these choke points, you, you might think, okay, well, um, perhaps India has a chance to control the Straits of Malacca, right, and kind of uh, control that choke point and gain the upper hand with China. But we see that with the with the advent of global warming, the decline of sea, sea uh, ice, right, um, in the Arctic, um, new passages are opening up, and and China is definitely trying to take um, advantage of those by asserting itself to be an Arctic power. And, um, you know, they've got their maritime uh, uh, Arctic uh, Silk Road um, that, that they're um, pushing out. And now they're, um, I believe they're building icebreakers. And, and, you know, if not, Russia's building more than enough, right? Um, so India is kind of in a, in a difficult position. And you can see they're, they're playing the submarine game as well. This is not simply about, you know, surface naval warfare, or controlling the choke points that way. Um, you know, the Indo-Pacific is, is teeming with, um, you know, Chinese commercial vessels and probably Chinese submarines uh, underwater and they're everywhere, right? Now India's kind of hope um, in geostrategic terms, had been Chabahar, uh, you know, um, Port of Chabahar in India. Um, and the idea was that, you know, um, essentially India, Iran, and Afghanistan um, could develop the, the Port of Chabahar and, and a, a trade corridor that way, right? Um, and unfortunately, what China has done with the Port of Gwadar. Um, 
in occupied bull orchard stands um, is quite transparently an, an effort to project Chinese military power across this, this critical route, you know, that uh, India was pursuing with Chabar uh, with an eye towards what's called anti-access and aerial, area denial strategies, right? Basically um, limiting uh, India's ability to operate really in its, its own near waters, right? And now China has announced a mega deal with Iran, which is dimming hopes for Chabar. And, um, you know, of course, some people, you know, blame Trump withdrawing from the uh, JCPOA, from the Iran deal, um, for basically, um, you know, making that, that, giving China that opening with uh, Iran. But I, I think that's not really the correct way to, to view it um, because this is bound to happen anyway. Um, returning to the JCPOA will probably only accelerate Iranian Chinese integration, in, in my opinion. Um, we can see what China is doing here um, in its attempts to, to really to box India in um, no more vividly than with with CPAC, right? I'm sure that's at the top of everybody's mind. You can see that it runs from occupied East Turkestan all the way to occupied Balochistan. This has real ramifications for human rights, which is, you know, really the, the seed of what I care about. Um, because what China has done, um, in its attempts to block India in, is turned East Turkestan into a gulag, right? Uh, giant prison. Um, and I would anticipate that you're going to see that happen all along the CPEC corridor and really anywhere that China goes, because the, the, the Chinese Communist Party is by nature an authoritarian, totalitarian regime. Um, which, you know, it, if it feels that it's not operating, uh, not expanding in a secure environment, it will work with the countries that, uh, you know, it, it's expanding into to secure that environment. We already see that with, with Balochistan, um, you know, the, the people there, the, they're being oppressed, I guess would be the nice nice way to say it. Um, they're not getting the jobs that, um, you know, they thought would be coming with CPEC. Those are going to imported Chinese labor or, you know, to, to non baloch people, right? Um, so there's a real, not only is there a military imperative, but there's also a human rights imperative here um, for India to decouple from China, to, to try to, throw up obstacles, throw up a roadblock to China's plans. Um, there's a uh, better example of, uh, you know, kind of what India had hoped it would be able to accomplish with, you know, um, with Iran, but those, those hopes are dimming. Um, now, we can see, essentially, I, I mentioned earlier that the A2AD strategy Basically, imagine this, this map, right? This is China's ability to limit um, uh, access to areas in the East China Sea, South China Sea, right? Um, now imagine that on the west side of India, right, emanating from the port of Guadar. That's, that's really what we're talking about here. On top of that, um, when you look at the the rail networks that China is building, um, India is being really uh, kind of outmaneuvered by China. Uh, sanctions on Iran have reduced the Iran-China trade, which you know is is good. Um, this is from the Foundation uh, for Defensive Democracies right here. Um, 
as you look towards the new administration um, in DC, um, my personally, my perspective would be that returning to the JCPOA will, will probably not benefit India like some might think it would um, if, if America were to do that. Um, so the bottom line here is that China is, is not a normal country, right? And we shouldn't think about it like a normal country. Modern China, since its founding in 1949, has kind of been built on um, oppression, really. It's, it's held together by the force of the state. Somebody earlier mentioned a monopoly on violence, and that's really what it is. And, you know, that's why we have the situation with Tibet, with East, East Turkestan. Um, China today is kind of a, a, a prison for everybody within its borders. And you can see what China is doing is kind of a, strat, a strategy of combining all of the aforementioned, uh, you know, strategies that are defined Western thinking uh, for the past century. And then some of you may be familiar with the, the book Unrestricted Warfare, which is written by two um, PLA Air Force colonels, um, which kind of described um, in, in even more detailed terms um, what China's strategy is, right? It, it's not just controlling the choke points and, and trying to, to take over the land routes to, to Europe, but it's also doing so through a combination of lawfare and economic warfare and network warfare and even support for terrorism or, or the tacit support for people who do support terrorism at the very least, right? Plus we mentioned the force technology transfers, the IP theft, civil military fusion, um, wartime levels of espionage, massive data collection. Um, it really is a threat unlike the free world has ever seen before, right? And what China is doing now is, is they're taking that strategy of controlling the choke points in the ocean, right? And they're, they're applying that same strategy to controlling the choke points in cyberspace. And you see that with, with China's massive build out of fiber around the world and with their, their rollout of 5G everywhere, even, you know, sub-Saharan Africa, anywhere you go, there's China pushing 5G, right? And they're doing this because they, they want to control the choke points for data. Data is the new resource. China's collecting massive amounts of data at the choke points in the cloud. Um, the last speaker mentioned India banning 200 apps, right? And that, I, I, I audibly cheered when India did that, um, that, that India had the guts to do that. And I hope when India's national cybersecurity strategy um, is released, I believe it's, it's in the final stages of being formulated, that this is um, really codified in a, a more um, concrete way so that um, people have no doubt that India is like just going to enforce these rules consistently um, against China, and, you know, maybe against Pakistan, Pakistani apps or whoever it, whoever it is that might be challenging, um, you know, India's national security, right? China has this advantage due to asymmetric access to the free world's data. They lock their data behind the Great Firewall, but we give it away for free. America does, India does, we all do. We give it to social networks like Google and Facebook. We give it to credit unions. We give it to data brokers. Right? There, there are huge companies that people have never heard of, which are aggregating, collecting, and aggregating, collating all of our data, right? Whether it's from, you know, surveys that you fill out online to, you know, cookies on websites that you visit, right? And these data brokers, they, they build these, these profiles and consumers, and then they sell them. And Part of the problem is that we don't know who they sell this data to. And they might think that they're selling it to, you know, Americans, Europeans, or Indians, or whatever, but 
um, because we don't have insight into their operations, they could be selling our data to China. We just don't know. Making matters worse, China is also collecting genetic data via companies like BGI, the Beijing Genomics Institute. Um, BGI is, uh, you know, they're, they're operating in Pakistan. They're, they're operating everywhere since, um, you know, uh, COVID, um, since the pandemic. Um, BGI has been expanding its, its footprint uh, all around the globe, right? From, from, from Pakistan to Israel to, again, to Ethiopia, right? BGI is there. Um, California, right? They're, they're trying to sell their, their uh, genetic, uh, I'm sorry, their, their virus screening kits all over the world, right? And that poses a real risk because that data, that genetic data has uses. Now, when we look at the kind of the global market for the global cloud computing markets, we can see that, that China's got two big players right up there. And, you know, you might think, oh, 5%, 2%, okay, well, that's nothing to worry about. But the thing to understand here is that, that each of these clouds, these other ones, you know, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, IBM, these are actually a collection of clouds. Cloud providers contract with data center owners and infrastructure owners, and China is contracting with those same data centers and same infrastructure providers, right? And that poses a risk as well, um, because you don't want Alibaba or Tencent to have access to the same data center that your Google data or your Microsoft data is in, right? You don't you don't want China to have any access to that. And and so this is an area where America is just kind of barely getting with the program. We've, we've been doing good um, in, in kind of addressing this threat head on, but um, you know, there, there's still some facets of it, which we've not really come to terms with yet. Uh, Mr. Albert, that, you know, Mr. Albert, can I request you to uh, yeah. uh, hasten up your presentation because uh, we can cover some of the subjects that uh, you, you're mentioning as it's a very interesting and I mean, there's so many insights already from this, but as we are slightly short on time, can I request you to uh, kind of just uh, go through it a bit quickly, please? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely yes. Um, yeah, thank you. So all of this data, the, the, the bottom line here is that all of this data, um, China can use it for all of the purposes I mentioned, plus for training AI. And all of this data has dual use purposes. There are legitimate civilian uses, also there are military uses. We've seen that with the Xinhua data leaks, right? Um, China's been collecting data on TikTok, on Reddit, on warships, on politically exposed people. Um, and unless India moves to decouple, India is going to fall into to the same trap. So, so why should we do this? Well, I mean, the good news is that you know sovereign wealth funds have given India a vote of confidence. But, but the way that I would encourage you to think about this is that in 1996, IBM AI built. Uh, IBM was able to beat, right? Um, a human chess player in 1996. Then in 2015, um, Google was able to do that with the Chinese game of Go, right? Computer is able to beat a human. Things are accelerating. Now imagine India that you are playing the game of risk or monopoly versus a Chinese quantum computer. They've already figured out what your next moves are. In 1983, there was a game, or there's a there's a movie. It was called War Games, and kind of the the end of the movie was that uh, the AI realized that the only winning move is not to play, right? And and that's what I would encourage you all to think about: is that you know, as difficult as it might be. The, the best option is to decouple to not play China's game. So anyway, I appreciate you having me.
Thank you so much, Mr. Albert. You've, you've raised some very pertinent issues, especially with regards to the fact that, uh, as you summed up, the data is the new oil, as well as the fact that uh, how through the string of pearls, the, the showing of the maps, you showed how China is trying to consolidate its presence in the Indian Ocean. We'll try and take your uh, your inputs on the same uh, in the in the in the discussion in the discussion section. And uh, moving on to our last speaker, we have uh, Mr. Pradeep Kumar with us, Dr. Pradeep Kumar. So, uh, Dr. Pradeep Kumar is an assistant professor at the Institute of Modern Languages, University of Applied Sciences in Poland. Uh, he's also the president of Indo-European Education Foundation in Poland and has uh, is a part of uh, research and documentation initiatives of various numbers across the Europe. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Kumar also serves as the external expert for the Polish National Agency for Academic Exchange of the government of Poland. So uh, we welcome you, Dr. Kumar, and uh, I request you to give your uh, to make your remarks, please. Thank you. Sir, uh, you can sir, you unmute yourself. No, no, it's fine. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, uh, for giving my input on our uh, and uh, for this panel. It is really uh, very and you know, I especially like to give my sincere thanks to Abhisek and Santosi, those they have invited me and initiated such kind of topic, which is really great for not only for Indian citizens, but also for Europeans and the foreigners. Uh, you know, being as a last speaker, it's always for you to have limited uh, a time and uh, you are quite limited to give some, some outputs. But let me to start, uh, how and when we started to talk about decoupling, why we started to talk about decoupling today. So a uh, few sectors, Discover, which has been not uh, discussed or discussed, and I will pick up with a broad sense. So, uh, why why we are talking about decoupling today, and decoupling with economic impact, or also with the social, cultural, and uh, strategically military impact? So, let me come 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 to that point, and let's just start from uh, since 1988, uh, almost 45 years. No conflict or no uh, death of any soldiers on the border. And we had kind of understanding between uh, India and China that if peace is met at the border, uh, then the rest of uh, relationship will go forward. But if the peace is not maintained at the border, uh, uh, it's very difficult to continue our normal relationship, uh, which will impact negatively and adversely. And we have seen in recent uh, recent uh, days, weeks, uh, the things which has uh, happened at the border in Ladakh and other areas. Uh, we are very sensitive. Being as an Indian, we have started to think that both things cannot work together. Once we are protecting others, and another, another we are improving our economic uh, uh, tie-ups with, with both the countries. And then the voice came up that either uh, the Chinese policies, which has been implemented with their neighbors and, and especially with India, uh, very tactical side that they are showing that we would like to give you the things and accept the border actual control area where we have perception that these are the actual control. And you have to accept unilaterally. And, and that is important because uh, these are the Chinese perception that you as a sovereign country should accept our hegemony, what dictate to you. And the dictation is our perception of the, the, the actual control at the border side. And it is not going to be uh, discussed with bilaterally. So these are, these are the points which is uh, very much important to be considered why we are talking about uh, decoupling today. Uh, let me to come back again uh, to very important issues, which is saying a strategic side that is a strengthening the, the India uh, when we understand our comprehensive national power, if we are able to compare or we are able to accept the hegemony what they're imposing to us. 
So in that in that case, India is very straight way. Uh, say we don't accept your hegemony, and we are reacting on on the on the statement what they do on the act, how they behave at the border as well as in the economic sector. So India has reacted in a on the ground, especially with military strategy, and we will not take this uh, what we call the lying down. We don't uh, accept Chinese hegemony, and let them to react on our action plan and as well a thought indian citizen how we can decouple our relationship or minimize our relationship with china if we have a uh, continuous uh sense and the need of uh, because we we are going to limit our relations if we send such kind of uh, harsh masses to china through border and at the same time, uh, because our government, government of India, is looking further to have more and more investment in India. So through a local, in vocal, uh, uh, vocal in local, made in India, or such kind of programs which has been launched, we are looking further for the investment. And many uh, previous speakers they have presented that the trade or bilateral trade between India and po uh, India and, and China is quite high. But comparing to the export and import, we are not competitive even with the Chinese uh, Chinese goods, and we are more relying on them. So in that case, if we are reacting militarily, in action at the border, and at the same time we are enhancing our economic cooperation with China, it should give a very false or wizzy wizzy kind of a statement or or kind of relationship to be developed. So what I think uh, uh, in in the same manner. Uh, policy makers, lawmakers, the government, the current uh, Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, they have to take this uh, real step and and uh, uh, take uh, same action as they are showing at the border in the similar manner for the economic strength. So uh, let me to go for the next point. What I will uh, what I would like to uh, present you here: uh, policy engagement. Because uh, these are, again, uh, very important issues that how we can tackle being as a country of emerging economy with the second largest population in the world, with highest youngest population in the world, as some of our speakers mentioned that we are, uh, we are the second largest English speakers in the world. So how we can, we can adopt that policy? Some of you also, you have mentioned that we can block 3G, uh, 3G activities or, or their test uh in, in in india so we have banned it or we supposed to ban it as uk have have done uh, a few weeks ago uh 200 applications we have blocked that is not enough we understand that the flow between india and china in the term of economy is quite high and we are more uh uh, depending on the Chinese uh, economic flow, then, then our outflow to India. So export and import is quite limited. From Indian side, export is quite limited than the, than the uh, import. So I do understand. It will be very painful for India when we go for decoupling. But of course, what we have to, to see from uh, my masses that Complete decoupling is not possible now, because uh, if we do uh, uh, make in India program or local for vocal program, we need made in India program. So we need to have some some foreign capital to come to India. But uh, we will choose where we want to decouple with with India. They could of course push back. If we are going to, to select some kind of areas where we are going to do decoupling, Chinese are not going to, 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 to watch that, okay, India is taking action, so we don't have to behave or we have to just accept, accept their, their proposals. But we take some actions and they will react on it. Uh, so we should expect that completely would be the same uh, retaliations which has been done at the border. And we can expect the similar retaliation in the economic sector. So I think India-China relations are going to uh, get worst, and 
going to be Detroit before they get better. Now, uh, coming to the point, policy of dealing with China. From the international angle, as uh, uh, we have seen uh, some of our research and the scholars, previous panelists, they presented, a strategic location and the boundary conflicts, border conflicts with India, China, and China and their neighbor countries, for example, Pakistan, Thai, uh, Tibet, Tur Turkmenistan, Iran, and other countries, uh, how they are they are, they are going further. And so in that case, India is supposed to go further with uh, developing their strategic partnership with USA. Of course, we're supposed to think about it and we're supposed to give a strength to that, that strategic partnership. But at the same time, we must think to develop our cooperation with Japan, Australia, South Korea, and possibly with Indonesia and Western European countries. So uh, depending uh, or, or such kind of way, what I can see is uh, if it is happening, little bit of, of development of business also uh, uh, can be uh, going further. Let's think other point, which is very important here. We need to find black spot. For example, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and South China Sea. Uh, there are uh, sensitive spots in China, like Xinjiang, Hong Kong, Tibet, and being as in the Indian policymakers, they must try to liberate to the extent possible these sensitive and blind spots where China is concerned. Uh, impact of decoupling, uh, from my point of view, beginning uh, from the shift, which is uh, showing here, uh, it is possible, and and the and the de decoupling must be taking place if we are sovereign country and we are looking further not as a competitive point of view but as a development point of view because uh economy or the model of economy which has been used in china is much more weaker than the economic of uh, uh, economic model which has been applicable to india is more strength uh, strengthened so here what i like to say uh, there are invisible resources from uh, the countries, too, which has not been counted, uh, and we are not going to depend on uh, surplus invisible uh, uh, investment from China only. We should look further, look further out of China and other neighbor countries around the world with whom we can develop our uh, our uh, you know uh, investment plan. So these invisible resources how to flow to india the government of india must think about decoupling through their own policy making rather than relying on the chinese policy making so the government of india must think how and which kind of policy we must bring to india which will encourage the foreign players to come india for their investment and get their profits so so i think uh, that this particular uh, area uh, of COVID-19 and, and, and the current situation which is going on on the border gave us a very clear picture uh, to India as Indian citizens in general and towards the world that how we can develop our economic uh, framework of within our own country and, and so that these are the possible resources from the part of the world will flow in. Now, uh, let me to give uh, concluding words here. Uh, as we can see, China-India strategic partnership is not from today. And uh, we have time to time uh, so many conflicting issues we have faced. And we are looking further to go ahead. And there will be many uh, more issues. Uh, I, I think that some questions will be coming up. And we will be uh, uh, very happy to address that question. So my my. One uh, last point is, government of India must consider their principles and policies towards strategies making with China, other neighbor countries, as well as inviting foreign players to, in, uh, to, to the country or inside the country by keeping in mind how other invisible resources which has not been uh, accessed to bring Indian souls and in Indian strategy system. Thank you. Thank you so much. Looking further for the questions.
Thank you so much, Dr. Thank Kumar, you. for your insightful remarks. There is one uh, intervention from my side. Coming from an accounting background, I am sure uh, uh, Dr. Patnak sir will also uh, correlate to this. Uh, when we are looking at uh, decoupling or in fact coupling or doing any strategic decision in terms of economy, it, it, it becomes an imperative that uh, we look at it in very simplistic terms as to what should our strategy be. And in accounting terms, generally talked as to what is the way a cost of uh, goods sold is calculated. So first of all, you have raw materials, then you have labor. That's when the product reaches the gate of the factory. Then it goes to the go down or to the office, wherever it is stored. Uh, from there, there is some kind of servicing cost, administrative cost that adds to it. And from there, it basically goes to the, uh, the place where it is sold and then to the customer. Now, looking at this process, we can actually see that China influences so many of these aspects at every single level. And it's not just in India, as uh, as Mr. Albert said, that how uh, China is, uh, is trying to control data, which is something that comes uh, throughout the value chain. Uh, in terms of raw material, uh, Dr. Patna, uh, Dr. Patnaik had said uh, early on as well that uh, how uh, India is dependent on so many of its basic, uh, like the, the things or the services or the sectors in which it is looking as uh, to be the aspirational uh, leader. Uh, we are still dependent on China for so many raw materials. In terms of labor, uh, almost all the speakers have said as to how China has a cost competitiveness. And one aspect which I think uh, in the overall discussion, because it's, it's slightly India specific, which is that uh, China also very proactively engaged in developing infrastructure in our country. And now uh, we are coming at a stage where we are very uh, proactively decoupling ourselves from the infrastructure development side of China as well. So uh, in terms of uh, strategy, I think always add to our uh, to our perspective on things so uh coming to the kind of questions that i've received uh the first question i would like to uh i would like to jointly ask uh, mr abhijit ayar mitra and uh, mr albert which is related which is uh, i mean all of you can see it it's already there in the chat from mr sushrut uh so he's saying that uh, the, uh, do you think it is in the short run it will be in india's interest to kind of have a you know a kind of a strategic position as we are entering into a phase of cold war and uh, if we are looking at a unsc permanent seat as uh, the 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 audience the mr sushrut is asking uh, what kind of strategy should we adopt so i think uh, first abhijit probably you can go and then we can have mr albert on this sure uh, look uh, you know the cold war is a product of when manufacturing was a lot easier you know, uh, in the 1960s and 70s, when a Bo when Boeing manufactured a plane, uh, 85 to 93 percent of it was made in house on location. Today, when Boeing makes a plane, less than 25 percent of it is made at the Boeing factory. The remaining 75 percent is made uh, abroad by micro, medium, and small sector companies, which is you know the nature of global manufacturing has changed completely. So, you know, uh, what was applicable with the Soviet Union, uh, USA versus the Soviet Union, isn't applicable with China. Because remember, China's industrialization itself uh, started in 89. Uh, the Cold War had virtually ended, uh, 91 uh, uh, as in full on end to the Cold War. So the economic paradigms you're looking at wasn't as a result of some thought out strategy. It was uh, uh, the the methods adopted by America against the Soviet Union were based on the industrial reality of the time. The methods of engagement adopted by the USA against China are based on the industrial reality of the 90s because the digital revolution happened in the uh, uh, 80s and the information revolution in the 90s. Uh, the second one, uh, the second part of it, uh, of that question, which was, uh, sorry, uh, the UN Security Council seat, uh, you're not getting it in my lifetime. You know, I, I don't know why people in India believe that China is going to agree to a Security Council seat for India. 
But every time I go to China, uh, remember the Chinese foreign ministry is a joke. Even their own military and their own party doesn't take the uh, uh, Chinese foreign ministry seriously. Uh, the people to talk to are the People's Liberation Army. And they're very clear that uh, th they won't allow India into the Security Council in 100 years. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, it's... Uh, 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 it's quite delusional, actually, to think that, uh, and we've, we seem to have this consistent uh, blind spot with regards to China. Uh, we, we take them at face value, despite hundreds of lessons in the past and present to not take them at face value. Uh, they will bla blatantly lie to you saying, oh, we, you know, we have not given nuclear weapons to Pakistan. Oh, we've not given nuclear weapons to uh, North Korea. Oh, we've not given uh, uh, missiles, uh, missile technology to Pakistan. Um, uh, do you believe any of that? No. So when they say, you know, oh, maybe we'll give you a security council seat. Don't believe them. They're going to veto it. Not happening. Unrealistic. Thank you, uh, Mr. Albert. Uh, can you please give your remarks uh, on the same question? Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, so I would say with regard to uh, kind of the strategy uh, that uh, or the posture that India should be adopting, um, I would I would stress that, you know, India is now a, uh, you know, a major defense partner of the United States and um, is now a part of the quad um, uh, kind of emerging alliance. And um, I would say that India, together with um, those partners, um, should look towards uh, something called National Security Decision Directive 75, which was passed by the Reagan administration in 1983, I believe, um, NSDD-75. Um, it basically laid out America's policy um, towards dealing with the Soviet Union. It um, was based on three points, which was containment, right? Um, I think India should seek to contain uh, China in all domains possible. Um, also, it stressed support for democratic movements within the Soviet Union. And um, the third thing was um, an insistence on mutual reciprocity. Um, and that may be difficult dealing one on one with China, but when you have friends, which India does, um, that's something that uh, that you can insist on and should. Um, and then um, one minor point is um, somebody pointed out to me that um, one or more of those maps um, may have uh, shown integral parts of Indian territory as um, belonging to Pakistan, which is absolutely not correct. Um, the the person who uh, sent me the message said that uh, one of the maps showed Gilgit Baltic. Uh, as part of Pakistan, which uh, is not something I agree with, but I, I didn't make the maps. Um, the people who made them, uh, it was listed on, on the images. Um, and then with regard to um, a, a Security Council seat, um, I mean, uh, it's my opinion that uh, the United States, frankly, should um, restrict visas for China's UN delegation um, until such time that um, China is held accountable for the pandemic, um, and uh, India might as well get China's seat in the meantime. Thank you. Thank you for your reply, Mr. Albert, and we appreciate the fact that uh, the, the clarification that you gave for the map. Uh, moving on, uh, uh, Dr. Patak, sir, uh, being a public representative and someone who's also been a part of the government system for so long, uh, my question to you, sir, would be that uh, what do you think governance and legislative interventions that can be made uh, to ensure that the economic decoupling takes place as well as something that you very, uh, very strongly made a point about as to uh, having an excellence nature in terms of both manufacturing and services like that is created in our country, sir. Sir, uh, sir, you'll have to, sir, unmute yourself, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Jairaj, for this question. Uh, the uh, I didn't talk about it, but very correctly, uh, uh, you know, data was talked about. So, uh, I, as you know, I'm a member of the Joint Parliamentary Committee on Data Protection. 
And we have been discussing, I think, in the last maybe more than 50 sessions of two hours each, uh, after interacting with a whole lot of stakeholders, including social intermediaries, the think tanks, the policy makers, the government, the non state actors, everybody, we realized what uh, uh, was just spoken about that data is going to be uh, what uh, what the Chinese would be looking forward to control the world through. Uh, and therefore, we have to be very careful. And he very correctly said that the Chinese have taken advantage of the data outside uh, of the world, but they have never let any of their data come outside their um, borders. Uh, so this is one area where we are, we are trying to expedite uh, the policy framework in the form of that bill. Uh, and probably it would see uh, the um, light of the day very soon in the parliament. In which case, I think both in terms of control of cross-border data flows, data localization, that is storage. You know, I, I can go on and on about the, uh, you know, about the cloud uh, capture of the cloud world cloud infrastructure by the Chinese. Uh, in fact, this is a golden opportunity for India to become the data capital of the world. And that's not easy though, but policy frameworks, coercive measures cannot sufficiently change the regime, change the ecosystem. It has to be both push and pull. So the finance minister announces measures to promote data centers. And the, 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 the incentives are there. But then if you have 64 licenses to be taken for setting up a data center, who will set it up? So these are policy measures which have to be taken at one go uh, by an individual group kind of a stuff because it has to happen in a single package and it cannot be in a piecemeal manner, which I think is still happening in a piecemeal manner. You are reacting to something. You are not incentivizing the creation of a data, a data economy in the country, in which case we would be having the largest cloud service of the world and land or even the United States. So that's what we have to strive. That's what the policy push has to take place. A number of regulatory measures by 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 sitting by all the ministries uh, sitting together. So that's on the data front. On the front of this is about the software part. About the equipment, I still think we haven't got enough regulate enough regulations because even a dead cell phone is collecting data about your body, about your about, about everything, what we call as personal data, as was being spoken about by by the by the earlier speaker. So that's where again we have to intervene. Uh, the other aspect, which is a broader thing, uh, is that once you have this quest for excellence, you realize that if you, and India, the second aspect is quality. What distinguishes the world from the Chinese is this aspect. The Chinese never gave any importance to quality, produced everything that was just low cost. But the world is not like that. So we can differentiate ourselves, our products, by emphasizing on quality products at a cost which is competitive. And by doing that, we are actually not going to be falling into the trap of actually competing directly with a Chinese product. But the quality aspect would come into account only if, I repeat, only if there is a quest for excellence. If it is a chalta hai attitude, it will not happen. So that's where the administrative, the political, even the social fabric has to think about. Absolutely, sir. Thank you so much for your insightful remarks, especially the fact that how you mentioned that just like ease of doing business or ease of living, we also need to have something of a metric of ease of data accessibility, data storage in the country. Uh, That's right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, moving on to the next question, uh, Dr. Sharma, ma'am, uh, there's a question with regards to the education system in the country where uh, Mr. Srinivas has asked a question that uh, how do you think that in a country as in India right now, where we are expected to raise our uh, per capita uh, amount spent on education. So uh, with there are there is there are so many different boards in the country. There are so many regulatory agencies, and uh, in the middle of them, we are trying to pursue the goal of uh, world class of providing world class education to our students. And uh, so how do you think, uh, what are the kind of measures probably that can be taken to improve the quality of education? Because uh, educated per capita, uh, I mean, the demographic dividend that you very rightly mentioned, 
can only come to uh, use or can only be optimized when they are well educated so ma'am your remarks on that uh thank you mr jairad it's a very pertinent question especially in today's india and especially today when we are going through the covid situation and uh, most of the country we are not able to go the school the students are not able to go to the school because we do not have those facilities available to all the students especially at the lower income group i would say more pertinently uh yes with the new uh, education policy we are moving towards more skill oriented education to begin with first secondly the government is trying to come out with a education system which is going to be uniform throughout india and for that many steps are being taken and especially during this pandemic i would like to highlight that there have been uh, classes for the students on doordarshan they have been catering to the classes especially for the students who were living at the village level so that their skill sets are not gone away with and they are able to improve themselves we have mooc which has been created so well then we have the uh, open credit system the uh, credit system in which you can take a um, let's say you want to take an economics micro uh, 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 course and you can take it from an iit professor also so you can have those credit systems coming to you from different all over india wherever you choose to study from and that is now accounted into your mark sheet so you know there are a lot of things which are being done at the level of the policies much yes of course needs to be done because look at the diversification of your own economy on your own structure your villages everything but overall i would say a shift towards skill based education which is actually the requirement of the time and the day is in place and you cannot do something just with one hammer and then it is done it you're talking about skilling india and india where in you see you have all levels of people all level of uh, children there so over yes again i come back to your question the demographic dividend yes we can in cash that provided we have the skills and there has been a debate going on for the last 10 years now that what are the skills required outside india and we skill our people accordingly so that we actually export our own skilled manpower outside so all those moves are actually going on and uh, we are in the process and hopefully we will be reaching the desired results also thank you uh mr jairaj you are muted thank you so much ma'am thank you for correction uh um, i'll move to the last question uh, for the session it is to uh, pradeep kumar ji uh, dr kumar my question to you is that uh, you because you have an ex have an extensive experience uh, based out of europe we are seeing a very concerted action from the european union Uh, on the kind of activities that china uh, has been doing especially in the recent months we have witnessed how uh, both uh, mr emmanuel macron and and uh, angela merkel have taken a very strong stand as far as the european union against china especially with regards to 5g is concerned so uh, if you can throw some light on the on the current uh, perspective or the kind of uh, thought processes that are going on at the european union level as far as their relationship with china is concerned Thank you so much, Jairaz. Uh, quite interesting question because uh, uh, being in Poland and and working with the European Union, we do realize that uh, power shift and the balance of power in the international relations are changing and shifting, especially when we are uh, going through this uh, pandemic situation. So uh, rightly, you you have mentioned that many countries in the European Union. especially with the western european countries like france uh, germany uh, you have uk and other countries they are taking quite restricted measures 
and very strong uh, kind of implementations they have done with the Chinese goods, Chinese uh, uh, relationship, and they're strategically with 5G uh, uh, checking and, and the execution in, in the European Union. Be because people, they are very much concerned with uh, how it is going to react, how it is going to affect our physical and the mental, uh, mental health issues. So uh, probably uh, they are going to be restricted as per uh, comparing with Indian activities, European Union and the many European countries, they are very much positive. Even I was very much surprised by knowing uh, during the current uh, scenario, during pandemic time, uh, Poland has come up with the highest uh, export import partners in the Central Eastern European countries with India. So we are the we are the fifth largest uh, exporters uh, to India and many uh, Polish companies, they have uh, targeting or targeted to go to Indian economy and uh, Indian companies as well, they're coming here. So I think that uh, the relationship which has been developed between India, Poland, uh, specifically since uh, World War II, uh, when uh, thousands of in, uh, Polish children were protected and, and homed in, uh, in, uh, in Gujarat. Uh, and especially they have a still a small place where they call, call Mave, Poli, Mave Polsche, so a small Poland in India. So that kind of uh, relationship, which has been based on very uh, practical manner, evidently uh, that is helping towards uh, European to think positive and make a strategy to develop uh, business strategies with India rather than to China. So, so such kind of very positive energy, which is coming from the European Union side as well. They're very much positive. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. Your answer, Pradeep. And uh, uh, now with that, uh, we come towards the end of our session. So I would like to request uh, the representative from Red Lantern Analytica to please give the vote of thanks. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you're audible. Right. Uh, so India's largest source of economic dependence on China is in external trade. The fact that both countries are technically dependent on one another displays the friction and complexities in the entire process of decoupling. I am deeply gratified to be part of this webinar. Not only was this an intriguing one, but it gave us certain insights to understand further about the relevance of foreign policy. So without, without further ado, I would like to thank our panelists today for sparing their precious time to be part of this journey. Firstly, our Honorable Dr. Amar Patnaik, who has enlightened us about the autarky of India and the critical utility of resources to meet India's demands making India seek excellence in manufacturing and services. Mr. Abhijit Ayer Mitra, who enlightened us about the relevance of investment and trade with China and the other countries. Also the fact that the concept of jurisprudence and the economical society of India has been entwined in this discussion is truly appreciated. Dr. Shalini Sharma, Firstly, for the aesthetic presentation and for furthering discussions on the wolf warrior diplomacy and the trade differences, the regulations between India and China, whether the aspect of decoupling could be plausible in India's current situation as we try to curb COVID-19. Mr. Kyle Albert, where we discuss the relevance of the Iranian agreement of Chabahar the defense and the rail routes as well. Um, India needs to be mindful of the Gwadar issues and consider modern China's illegitimate uh, regime. Data has become a prominent resource that has to be considered becoming a huge collection of clouds. Dr. Pradeep Kumar for a con conclusive viewpoint on the competence of India and the dependence India has on China. It's beyond the scope if, of economy. It's about the relationship between countries. What viewpoint can be developed if we accentuate the friction of India and China? Even if we decouple, even if we decouple it, to what extent could we minimize the role of China in the Sino-Indian relations? Furthermore, the discussion on skill-based learning and a comparative analysis of the relations European Union and the United States has with India and China respectively. 
thank you so much for making this session so exceptional and for providing us with a clear holistic viewpoint on our topic for today we are honored to have our expertise panel today now for the individual that ensured the smooth functionality of today's webinar our moderator mr jairaj pandya this discussion of knowledge and understanding would not have been possible without you we definitely cannot miss out on our red lantern analytica team especially mr abhishek ranjan and mr bhavdeep modi for providing us with an opportunity to learn further about foreign policies and the sino indian relations lastly to our interactive audience that were keen to learn about the topic and were inquisitive regarding it as well this definitely would not have been possible without your participation thank you everyone for being here and for making it one of the best webinars that i have personally attended 